If you have jumped on this trend when it began, you would have had the opportunity to go for gains of $41,850. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Mike Burnick, Director of Research here at Weiss. In today's program, we're going to examine what may well be the single most powerful tool for building wealth in today's crazy, upside down, and frankly, quite dangerous world. Powerful and most likely completely unknown to most investors, I might add. My special guests today are two of the most highly respected experts in this field, with more than 30 years of combined experience. Kathy Lean is Managing Director of BK Asset Management, a highly respected currency trading firm. Her career began at J.P. Morgan Chase as a trader of currency ETFs, options, Forex, and other currency vehicles. You may have seen Kathy's articles for MarketWatch, Currency Trader, and many other publications. She is frequently quoted by Reuters, The Wall Street Journal, and others. And you may have seen her as a frequent guest on CNBC's Squawk Box or Squawk on the Street. She's also the author of four authoritative volumes on currency trading. Boris Schlossberg is also a managing director of VK Asset Management, specializing in currency trading strategies. Widely known as a leading foreign exchange expert, Boris started his career on Wall Street over two decades ago with Drexel Burnham Lambert. And since then, He's traded a wide variety of financial instruments, from equities and options to stock index futures and, of course, foreign exchange. Mr. Schlossberg is a weekly contributor to CNBC's Squawk Box. His daily currency research is widely quoted by Reuters, Dow Jones, and it appears in numerous newspapers worldwide. Mr. Schlossberg is also the author of two widely respected volumes on currency trading, technical analysis of the currency markets, and Millionaire Traders, How Everyday People Beat Wall Street at Its Own Game. Together, in 2015, Kathy and Boris amassed a remarkable track record on their big trades model portfolio with currencies. From what we've calculated so far, out of 52 recommended trades, we calculate a 94% win rate. Well, it's no wonder I see you guys on TV so often with a betting average like that. Boris, Kathy, thank you for joining us today. Good to be here. Nice to be with you. Yes, we're glad to be talking to you at this important time in the markets. I think this special briefing is aptly titled A World Gone Mad. There's no doubt that 2015 was one of the craziest years for investors ever. We saw commodity price deflation, wars, terror, and political instability all over the globe on a scale unimagined just a few years ago. And it's still happening now. Just in the first few days of 2016, we saw North Korea testing a nuke, and Saudi Arabia and Iran are at each other's throats. Meanwhile, stocks are off to the worst start to the year in history. After going nowhere in 2015, the average stock is already down more than 25% below its 52-week high this year. And the bond market is a complete mess. That's certainly no way to grow wealth. You're absolutely right, Mike. But that's not really the bad news. The bad news is that many analysts are predicting that 2016 is going to be even worse. In fact, you might say that right now, the stock market looks a lot like a toy balloon in a room full of razor blades. The world is on the brink of chaos, and many analysts believe major economies will plunge off the cliff this year. You know, in fact, Mike, so many dangerous themes are coming together this year that we worry that it will take most stocks and other investments far too risky for most investors. The good news, though, is that there is an investment market that can help you produce huge profits when done properly, and do it consistently even at a time like this. Even in a world on the edge of madness, you can still make very consistent money. And as the title of your best-selling book implies, you're here today to tell us exactly how everyday investors can beat Wall Street and perhaps become millionaire traders themselves. So let's start at the top. What dangers do you see ahead for stock and bond investors in 2016? Well, I think that the market's just gotten a taste of the big moves that can happen in 2016. The year is relatively new, and we've already seen a, see a red in the financial markets. Yeah, you know, I saw you on CNBC recently, and you said the Fed is engaging in risky business, raising interest rates in the teeth of a global economic slowdown. In fact, you said they're ignoring a lot of weakness in the economy. Are they moving too soon? 
You're absolutely right. I can't help but think about what happened between 1936 and 1937, mm -hmm. when the economy was going strong, industrial production was moving forward, inflation at the time was around 5%. And guess what the Fed did? They raised interest rates for the first time in August 1936. At the time, the stock market didn't react by much. So they hiked again in March 1937, mm -hmm. and one more time in May. But then what happened was that after the March hike, rates spiked, stocks fell 10% that month and did not bottom until a year later in 1938. And over that year period, stocks fell a whopping 50%. So in other words, Mike, the Fed's exit strategy was a big disaster. And Boris, recently on CNBC's Squawk Box, you said the Fed is making the same mistake as they did in 1937, perhaps triggering a second Great Recession. Listen, Mike, everyone knows that the U.S. recovery is fragile and more rate hikes are going to set off global squeeze. Everyone from the Bank of International Settlements to Fitch have sounded the alarms on the damage that rate hikes could cause emerging markets, mm -hmm. which ultimately is going to come back to haunt our own markets. The BIS estimates that every 1% rise in the U.S. rates will cause a 0.4% rise in the cost of debt servicing for emerging market countries. And these nations simply cannot afford higher payments. So we'll see a surge of defaults, and that's going to come back and haunt us in our own markets very, very badly. I see what you mean. Now let's talk about the strengthening U.S. dollar. It's been hurting our exports and just crushing corporate profits. Is that going to be a continuing problem this year? Absolutely. The strong dollar is not just a big, but an incredibly huge problem for the U.S. economy as we go forward. Mm -hmm. We've already seen that the manufacturing data miss because of the dollar. And I can tell you that when you look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, those companies are American in name only. Mm -hmm. Fully 50% of their profits come from overseas. So you can imagine how badly the strong dollar is going to impact their earnings going forward. We're already seeing, as you said, so many warnings, and those warnings are only going to get much worse in 2016. Yes, in fact, it is estimated that a 10% rise in the dollar shaves off 0.5% from GDP growth in the first year, mm -hmm. and another 0.2% in the year that follows if the strength persists. According to the New York Fed themselves, the 10% drop in the U.S. dollar actually cuts the value of exports by 2.6%. So this also lowers commodity prices, inflation, and earnings. And as Boris said, we know that approximately 30% of U.S.-based firms um, in the S&P draw over 50% of their revenue from outside the U.S. So when the dollar rises, it can really take a big bite out of earnings. So to put the numbers in you know, very easy to understand terms, a 1% in the move in the dollar typically translates into a 2% hit in earnings. And we all know how weaker earnings can have an effect on stocks. Absolutely. We've seen that in 2015 and again so far this year. Now, let's talk about another worry you have, the American consumer. It's been the only thing really holding up the U.S. economy as manufacturing contracts. Right. What do you see ahead for that on that outlook? So this year? I think the American consumer is in a much weaker state that, than the Fed thinks they are. For example, when you look at the one key component, which is wage growth, there simply is no wage growth. The right. Fed is basically making this argument that we're going to have 2% inflation, which is why they need to raise rates. But when you're looking at wages, there is absolutely no growth in wages at this point. Yes, we're creating jobs, but we're not creating income. And if you can't create income, you're not going to get inflation. And therefore, there's very little reason for the Fed to raise rates even further. I see what you mean. Let's talk about the bond market. Last year, we saw incredible widening in junk bond spreads. They were plunging long before stocks. In fact, it looks like stocks are following junk bonds lower. Yes, that's true. Junk bond spreads yields, or the interest rates, are like canaries in the coal mine for the financial markets. They always warn first. And we've been seeing junk bond yields rise since mid-2015. And what's really scary, Mike, is that they tend to increase right before the recession hits and business investments turn negative. But that's already happening now. So it's definitely a dangerous time. And what's dangerous for the Fed right now is that they have absolutely no leeway to, raise, uh, to lower interest rates. Now, let's talk about another major threat that's sadly been with us far too long, terrorism. We saw it recently in Europe. What's your take on that? Unfortunately, it's really true, and it could be one of those things that uh, can come out of the woodwork and just completely blow everything up in, in, in terrible, terrible ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the biggest, I think, concerns when you talk, when I talk to geopolitical experts is the Mumbai type of attack, the attack where it's not just simply one terrorist act in one little location, but multiple terrorist acts in multiple locations. If that happens, that just freezes psychology, freezes the markets, creates enormous amount of political tension, and just puts a 
huge, huge pall over financial assets for a long time to come. Yeah. Right, Mike. And I think that, you know, we've seen the Paris attacks. There's a little bit of quiet in Europe right now, but in other pockets of the world, such as, such as Jakarta, as well as Turkey, we're seeing renewed terrorism. Mm -hmm. So that can hit Europe again at any time because TISIS really seems to be targeting that part of the world. Yes, they're definitely not quitting and they're definitely going to redouble their efforts. So there's always this incredible danger, I think, with them going forward. And, you know, closely related to terrorism is the threat of war. You talked about ISIS, but look at what else is happening in the Middle East. Now you have Saudi Arabia and Iran at each other's throat. That could, that could cause a major global war. Listen, the Saudi Arabia-Iran thing, I think, in my opinion, is one of the most uh, important and one of the most frightening geopolitical uh, developments that's going on, mm -hmm. simply because you now have the two major aspects of Islam at each other's throats, as you said. Mm -hmm. You have the Sunni and the Shia um, uh, Muslims basically really in a state of war. They've, they've killed diplomatic relations between the two countries, something unheard of. Um, even a year ago, you wouldn't have imagined something like this. So definitely the tension is happening. And here's the thing that I think is really worrying. With oil prices so low, with the population getting so restless, the prospect for war always becomes much greater when the economic tensions really rise. So therefore, something that looked maybe completely unrealistic a year ago becomes far, far more probable as we go into 2016. The Middle East isn't the only part of the world that we're worried about. I'm actually very worried about North Korea and what's been happening over there and how they mm -hmm. flex their muscles in the beginning of the year. And so I think you know there's so many centers around the world that could see sort of inflammation in terms of wars. And you know, we're watching the Middle East, we're watching Asia, and those are only the ones that are on our radars right now. I'm certain that as the year progresses, more will come will come to the forefront. Yeah, any one of these hot spots could certainly trigger a major swoon in the stock market. Now, of course, lest we forget, 2016 is also a presidential election year. Now, what kind of volatility will the presidential campaign in the election in November cause? So a contentious and bitter battle for the White House does lie ahead. Mm -hmm. And um, just to give you some numbers, it does show us that the returns in the S&P tend to be lower during election years. We looked at some data from S&P Capital IQ, and we found that over the past 60 years, stocks on average ex-dividends fall in the first quarter after the election. Mm -hmm. But what's even more interesting about their research is that there's a new layer of uncertainty. If a new president must be elected, and we know that this is one of those years that that has to be the case, mm -hmm. stocks perform even worse with the S&P losing on average 4%. Now, we're just talking about how the stock market is performing, but actually there's a lot of very distinct patterns in how the euro dollar, the U.S. dollar itself performs during elections years as well. Right. You know, and Mike, I got to tell you, the one thing about the election this year that's really unique is just how volatile it's going to be. I mean, it's looking more and more like we're going to see the two extremes of both parties become the dominant candidates in their parties. And that's going to create even more uncertainty in the marketplace and certainly probably exacerbate those uh, selling, selling trends that we've seen in the equity markets. Absolutely. In fact, we've seen that already just in the first few weeks of this year. Exactly. Now, another worry you have on your radar screen is depressed oil prices, which are widely being blamed for the collapse in corporate profits. Is that trend going to change, or are we going to see more losses ahead? You know, when you look at oil, the one thing you sort of really learn from the history of oil is that when mm -hmm. prices go down, they tend to stay down. It's a long-term move. And mm -hmm. I've been actually making an argument that it may be a permanent structural change because what's happening in the world now is that we're getting all these alternative energy sources coming online. And while it's very embryonic and it's sort of young now, it's all coming. The move towards electricity, the move away from carbon, uh, petro, uh, petrocarbon, all of it is actually going to have secular negative down, uh, downdraft on oil prices. So even if the demand for oil begins to tighten up, I don't think oil is really going to rise much in the future. And that's going to have a very depressive impact on the whole slew of manufacturing uh, aspect in the U.S. Uh, the US economy. Yes, Boris is absolutely right. So when it comes to these companies who have made record profits in recent years, they're now experiencing their deepest downturn since the 1990s. We have these big names such as ConocoPhillips reporting a billion-plus quarterly loss and spending cuts. And then Royal Dutch Shell, also one of the world's largest companies, are posting a $6 billion loss last year. These stocks have fallen as much as 30%. But the problem is that it's not just these big names that are being affected by lower oil. We have many other industries like transportation, food, airliners, and even financials are affected. Yeah, it's really created a mess, the energy sector, and it's really spreading to other sectors is what we're seeing now. Now, another worry on the radar screen is deflation. The global economy has been in the grip of deflation for years, but you see it getting actually worse before it gets better. 
Yes, you know, so the interesting thing with commodities, they all tend to move as a flock, right. right? And the fact that oil is going down is driving everything else down almost psychologically. So you see declines in gold, you see declines in copper and aluminum, and then you have the other very, very important trend, which is that China, which was the absolute buyer of all these commodities, has basically stopped. The, all of their boom in building, in construction, and everything else has really, really calmed down significantly. Mm -hmm. So the, the actual physical demand for all these commodities has really been tempered. And that, in addition to the, all the psychological impact of lower oil, is certainly having a massive deflationary impact on all the commodity prices going forward. And I would even add that the self-reinforcing cycle of a stronger dollar makes low commodity prices even lower, and that basically right. exacerbates the deflationary condition. So typically, low oil prices reignite demand, but that's not what's happening if the economy is weak. And as Boris mentioned, we could be looking at the same deflationary vortex that everyone was talking about in early 2015. Okay. Let's talk about tough new capital requirements for banks. Is that going to squeeze the financial system as well this year? It's already starting to, and there's so much complaints. I read a lot of financial press and a lot of sort of insider baseball um, newsletters, and everybody's complaining about the fact that the Dodd-Frank rules are really constraining the banks from taking on any risk. Remember, mm -hmm. Um, it's the banks that really take on risk and create liquidity for everybody else to be able to trade. And the fact now that they really are not allowed to and they have to have much higher capital requirements for every single position they want to assume really creates a very, very skittish market. And this kind of skittishness you're already seeing in bonds, you're seeing this in, in, in other commodities, and it's only going to get much worse as we go forward. Yeah, and you know, the situation is not only bad for big U.S. banks, but what about those in Europe? I mean, they're, they're much worse off there. We see lending contracting in Europe. What do you think about the Eurozone, and is that a big risk for 2016? Yes, I mean, Europe faces serious risks next year. Between the instability um, in the Middle East and geopolitical tensions with Russia, the slowdown in China, high un unemployment, stagnant wages, we all know how unproductive they are. We don't see any possibility of a recovery in the Eurozone anytime soon. The population in Europe, and the big problem, not just for Europe, for many pockets of the world, is that they're aging. And with debt to GDP levels over 100%, for some countries, they won't be able to handle the greater public spending that is needed to properly process all of the refugees that are coming in and the need to build border fences in order to defend against terrorism. Right. So in the unfortunate scenario of another coordinated terrorist attack, we think that Europe will convulse into crisis. Yeah, and just across the uh, English Channel, you've got a, a major referendum coming up this year for to see whether the UK will even stay together. Right. You know, the big trend that we're seeing, the very, very negative trend that I think is going to impact the world is this whole move away from unification right. to fragmentation. So of course, you know, the danger in Europe is that many of the members there are going to fragment. And Britain is at the helm of this. Mm -hmm. Britain is actually going to vote on the prospect of the idea that it's going to exit the EU. And should they do this, this could be a avalanche that they could trigger, simply because if they leave the EU, then the Scots are going to say, well, we want to live the, we want to leave the, uh, the British Isles, and it's going to just trigger Catalonia in Spain and every other um, entity in that region that wants to have independence. So when everybody fragments, what do you have? Huge uncertainty, mm -hmm. massive volatility, and just, um, I think, terrible market conditions for all around. And in terms of the cost for a Brexit, no one knows how much it's going to cost because the exit terms aren't going to be um, agreed upon, discussed until they vote to leave. So there would definitely be a deep period of economic uncertainty that will hurt consumer, business, and investor confidence, which ultimately hits headline growth. So mm -hmm. I think it's a big problem for the UK in general and Europe. Look, I think it's a very simple and, and very easy idea to understand. Basically, when you have cooperation, coordination, unification, you have a lot of trade and people do a lot of business and everybody grows and becomes wealthier. When everybody starts to fragment and fracture and they stop trading with each other, they stop doing business with each other, naturally that's going to create massive deflationary and recessionary impact. And that is what we are afraid is going to be happening as we go forward next year. Right, so perhaps another recession in the cards for Europe. Let's turn our attention to Asia, and specifically China. Talk about experiencing some pain. So far in 2016, they've already had their own bear market, with stocks in Shanghai down over 20% already. Right, the days of 10% growth in China are clearly over, and the country is headed for its slowest expansion in decades, mm -hmm. with repercussions that would be felt around the world. 
China's focus on their environment and social reforms is extremely costly. And you know, we all remember that one day in August, I think it was the 24th, when the Shanghai stock market dropped 8.5%, and right. the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell almost 600 points. Um, and do you even remember the first uh, trading day of the year when Chinese stocks fell 7%? This is a taste of the volatility that China can cause for the economy in 2016. So China is expected to hit a growth wall in 2016, and this will create dramatic and disruptive period for emerging markets and developed markets, which very much will mean the end of the U.S. bull market. Boy, that's a lot for stock and bond investors to worry about, especially if you were around in 2000 when the tech wreck slashed 86 percent off the value of the average stock, or during the financial crisis in 2008 and 9 when the S&P 500 was cut in half. So let me ask you, is there a viable alternative to stocks and bonds for investors? In other words, is there a way to make money during a time like this and keep it growing as the world continues to grow more dangerous? Yes, our bread and butter, currencies. You know, currencies are the most liquid market on the planet and a wonderful opportunity to truly diversify in a way that's far removed from stocks. Right. Currencies is the ultimate in diversification. Adding currencies to your portfolio could give you a critical protection against the dangers now stalking stock and bond investors. They also give you profit potential that is unparalleled by many other investments. Look, Mike, they are the ultimate wealth building opportunity. No matter what's happening with U.S. or world economy or other investment markets, there is always a way to make money with currencies. Even when Wall Street is embroiled in the most vicious bear markets imaginable, currency investors can make money. The reason is because some currencies are always rising in value and others are falling, giving you the opportunity to make money. So in the darkest days of the Great Recession, you could have made a bundle on currency positions, like the select positions on the euro. For example, you could have walked away with gains of up to $27,281 in less than three months. And more recently, in 2015, certain investments on the Canadian dollar generated gains of 547 or 1,036 and up to 1,431 percent. Plus, some investments on the Swiss franc posted pre commission profits of 477 percent, 813 percent, and even up to 1,233 percent. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. And certain investments on the euro posted gains huge, 547 percent or 788 percent up to 1,204%, enough to multiply your money more than 13 times over. Now granted, we need to take into consideration that there is risk of loss involved with any trading strategy. So these are only examples to illustrate the power of these investments, but the power is absolutely awesome. That's phenomenal. And what's really great is that currencies is the ultimate in liquidity. Mm -hmm. The worldwide currency market is actually the largest market in the world, with more than $5 trillion changing hands on a daily basis. That basically gives you better odds at being right on the trade or having the trade execute at or near your target prices than any other market. Look, the ultimate in leverage. Using spot forex, you can control 10,000 euros for something as little as $219. So that's 50 to 1 leverage. With options on currencies, you can get massive leverage, enough to multiply your money many times over on every trade. For example, right now, there's an option that you can let you control the British pound worth more than $14,700, and all you have to pay for it is $99 plus commissions. So that gives you 150 to 1 leverage. And if you're right, the profit potential could be huge and could turn a molehill of money into a mountain of cash in record time. That's amazing. So currencies provide the ultimate in flexibility because what's really great is that Forex does not just mean spot. You have the ability to express your currency views through ETFs, spot Forex trading, options and currency ETFs. There are currency vehicles that fit your objectives and risk tolerance hand in glove. Boris, give us a brief explanation of each of these vehicles and how best to use them. Sure. So, for example, currency ETFs make, allow you to basically trade currencies just like you would a stock. So you could trade the euro the way you would trade Apple or Google. Mm -hmm. Currency options are the same thing as options on stocks, and therefore they give you the best of both worlds. They give you lots of leverage but limited risk and controlled uh, way of participating in, um, in the market. And, of course, currency spot market is the ultimate inconvenience. It trades 24 hours a day, six days a week. Whenever you want to trade, there's a market that's ready to open and ready to deal. So if you want to do it at 3 o'clock in the morning like I often do or 3 o'clock in the afternoon like sometimes Kathy does, you can always make a trade in the currency market. Mm -hmm. 
and it's the ultimate vehicle for investors with limited risk capital. You can trade currency ETFs in your current brokerage account. The minimum investment is as little as the cost of one share. So right now, for example, you could buy an option with the potential to soar as the euro sinks for as little as $94. And in the spot market, many dealers accept trades as little as $100. And Boris, risk management is pretty simple too with Forex, isn't it? Uh, definitely. It offers you the ultimate in peace of mind. For example, limit orders and stop losses help make risk management very easy with currency ETFs, mm -hmm. Forex, and currency options. The brokers monitor your account 24 hours, 7 days a week with very specialized computer software designed to make sure you always have enough capital to cover the positions you have. So risk of loss is always possible with any trading strategy, but the beauty of this is that when purchasing options, for example, your risk is strictly limited to the amount you invest. Plus, you'll never have to worry about a margin call with currency ETFs or currency options. To help you manage some risk, you can also use a Forex broker that has automatic controls to avoid margin calls. And it's the ultimate in simplicity. Picking the right stock out of some 40,000 on the New York Stock Exchange can be like trying to find a needle in a haystack. But in the foreign exchange market, you only need to consider eight major currencies. And these currencies are familiar to most of you. It's the US dollar, the euro, the British pound, the Japanese yen, the Swiss franc, and the New Zealand dollar, Australian dollar, and the Canadian dollar. Plus, currencies are money, and they move on simple supply and demand fundamentals. They naturally don't suddenly dive in value because the CEO retires or because of an earnings surprise disappointment. You know, they are the ultimate trending investment also because currencies tend to move in massive, sweeping, long-term trends. For example, you're seeing this right now with a dollar, right? Um, it's very easy to buy and sell at the most advantageous time. So, in fact, we find that Forex market has the cleanest steadiest and longest long-term trends of any major market in the world. And these are easily recognizable trends. So mm -hmm. the move in the US dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, the Swiss franc, the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, this is another big trend that we're seeing right now with all the commodities going down in, um, in value, offer you countless opportunities to multiply your money. Take the US dollar, for example. It's been soaring for nearly three years since February 2013. If you have jumped on this trend when it began, you would have had the opportunity to go for gains of $41,850 as the greenback soared against the Canadian dollar and $50,170 as it skyrocketed against the Australian dollar. Currencies sound like the ideal investment vehicle for a market like this. Look, Mike, it's the ultimate tool for building wealth fast. For example, if you bought a particular investment on the Canadian dollar last January, you could have walked away with 727% gain in just 10 days. Mm -hmm. Last March 17th, you could have purchased an investment on the New Zealand dollar, walked away with more than 1,048% gain in just six days. And last August 20th, you could have bought an investment on the euro and walked away with 1,092% gain in just four days. So at that rate, every 10,000 invested would have turned into 100,000 in less than a week. Now granted, there is also risk of loss associated with trading strategy, and each year currency traders seek dozens of opportunities like these. That's a lot of reasons to love currency trading. But the question is, how to get started trading currencies? And which currency should I be trading right now? And why? And this is where I have great news for our viewers. Boris and Kathy have agreed to share their top three predictions for 2016 and the currency trades they're counting on right now to help multiply their subscribers' money in the year ahead. It's all in a very special series of three video briefings Weiss Research will, will present next Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The title, Three Shocking Forecasts for 2016. And your host for the series will be none other than Larry Edelson, Mike Larson, and yours truly. That's right, Mike. And in each of these briefings, we will give you one critical, and I must say, surprising geopolitical or economic forecast for the year ahead. And we will actually name the currencies that we believe will sink and those that stand to soar as these events unfold. The profit potential on these kinds of trades is truly enormous, as we've seen. Just imagine, one option on the first trade alone could generate pre-commissioned profits of as much as 1,600%. Now, that's enough to turn every $10,000 invested into $170,000. And it can happen in as little as a few weeks and sometimes in just a few days. The best news of all is all three briefings are free. There's no charge, no strings attached. All we ask 
is that you tell us you're coming so we can make sure we have enough room for you. So to reserve your place right now, simply click the button below this video screen. Boris and Kathy, thanks very much for your time today. Thanks, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much, Mike. Well, you've given our viewers an excellent overview on the huge profit potential now available in currencies. Next week, we're going to dig even deeper into the major trends with the potential to make currency investors very wealthy in 2016. This is Mike Burnick for Weiss Research. Thanks for joining us today. And whatever you do, do not forget to click the button below to reserve your place at next week's important briefing. Thank you.